That was wonderful. Whew. Wow. Well, today is a, a different kind of a day for us today because we are, we are celebrating the legacy that Diane King Van leaves behind after 12 years of being our music director. And I will say that um, while you've been here for 12 years, I have only had the opportunity to experience you for the last two years. And I have heard so much, and I'm only disappointed that I didn't experience all that you brought to the choir as you rebuilt it and the, the, the show choir and the performances that have been done here. And so I think that I can speak for all of us in saying thank you, Diane, for all you have given. <laughs> You know, there's something about um, when you work with somebody who um, is so professional and talented and gives their heart that inspires us to all be better and all boats rise. And I know that that's been our experience. And I, and I hope that you will all stick around for after the service because we have some wonderful things planned, um, some more celebration of the legacy that... Uh, our beloved Diane King Van is leaving behind as she retires from our center. So don't be so quick to run off <laughs> because there'll be more. <laughs> uh, we are, boy, that song was great. It was a great lead into this idea of living out loud because we've been talking about living out loud all year long. And it's, it's had its impact. You know, I can see the kind of little shifts that are happening. We've, we've experienced shifts in our own community. There have been people who have um, decided to do more, and there are people who have decided they needed to step back, and that's the ebb and flow of life that, that we're experiencing. I want to take a minute, and I want to recognize our board of trustees. We've, we had two board members that had to step down because of personal matters. And then we had two new trustees that have stepped in. We have a new board president. That's Tony Sparks. Tony, you stand. <laughs> and the rest of our board, if you please stand, we have Vice President Reverend Judy Chapman. Our treasurer is not here right now. That's Rick Terrazano, our secretary, Reverend Karen Allen, our uh, trustee member, Barbara Lindquist, and our trustee member, Dan uh, Martin. Let's give them all a hand. And I, I want to thank you because these trustees really are central to all the, um, you know, the backbone of this community. There, you, you know, I come up here and I, I can say some words. I try to educate and inspire and advocate for us to really live this philosophy with the music, you know, inspires all of that and, and gives it a, a different flavor and a texture. But it is the board of trustees that really supports and does the, the hard work, and I would say wonderful work of supporting our community in another way. So I'm, I'm really grateful for those that have stepped up, and I'm really excited about where we're going. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> um, hmm. So all month we have been looking at this idea of the sacred. And we've talked about the sacred as the mundane, the places where it is unexpected, and we've talked about the obvious sacred and looking for the sacred in places we may not look. And, and if you're following along in your weekly catalogs about the talks, today's talk title is supposed to be The Profane. Um, but I, we, I, I might touch on that a little bit, but really I've changed that talk title to Love the One You're With. Yeah. Love the One You're With. And, I, and many of you might remember that title from the infamous Stephen Stills song of 1970. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, and it, it was performed live by Crosby, Steele's Nash & Young, and it was, it was sort of one of those demarkers of a time in our culture where we were moving through a lot of change. The, 
you know, we had just, you know, been through the 60s. We're a little before my time being born in 1961. I, I know in the 70s, I remember hearing about all the, the shift and change that was so dynamic in our culture in the 60s. And I'm feeling a little envious, like I'm, you know, with that term FOMO, like I missed, you know, fear of missing out. I feel like I've missed something there. But what I know about that time in our culture, it was a time for really living out loud. You know, this whole theme about living out loud that we're talking about this year was personified in the 60s. There was young people who were clamoring for more peace and more freedom of expression and free love. And uh, it was a time when our music shifted greatly. There was rock and roll through the late 50s and throughout the 60s began to change its dimension and flavor in our society. And, whew. and I'll say that there were some that felt that that was indeed a sacred and pivotal time in our culture. And yet there were some that felt it was profane, <laughs> that felt it was the downfall of civilization. And yet that era ushered in a continual momentum of change, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, but we, you know, our culture continued to shift and the new genres of music came forward. And, um, and I was, th you know, I, I sometimes think that those of us that fought so hard against our um, elders who thought that rock and roll was profane might turn on the Grammys once in a while and look at the music of today and the free expression of all the musicians. And you might think that that's profane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of the, you know, I looked up that idea of profane in the dictionary and it really just means the opposite of sacred. This simply says there, you know, profan pro the profane is, is that that is not sacred. But here's the thing. We teach that it's all God. That either it's God or it's not. It's either all God or it's not God. And it can't be all God except for this and that and the other thing and some other exception that you might come up with. So how do we navigate those things that we find unlovely? How do we navigate the things that we find to be ungodlike? It's not easy. It's not easy. And if I was to look at the shift that I've been witnessing over the last, I don't know, five, ten years in our culture, it seems it's been kind of tumultuous. It's almost like, feels like the 60s, but maybe not as fun. <laughs> not, as, <laughs> not as groovy. <laughs> not as hip. <laughs> Depends on who you talk to. Um, but I, it does feel like there's, there's more movement in our culture, and it's, you know, our culture tends to uh, sway with the wind of popularity, and it can be easy for us to get lost in who we are, lost in the things that are important to us, lost losing our, our sense of values and the things that are important to us when we have to either go with the flow or stand against it. Stephen Stills in his song, Love the One You're With, he, he sings, don't be angry, don't be sad, don't sit crying over good times you've had. His lyrics, I felt as I, as I listened to the song again, as I had kind of just popped this talk title out, I said, why is it that this inspiration came up to me? And for me, I think there's this beautiful idea of loving the one you're with is being really present in the now moment with whoever you're with. You may not agree with them. You may not like the things that are important to them, but at the same time, you have this opportunity to recognize the God in them. And that's not so easy when somebody's values feel diametrically opposed to yours. And it does feel like I talk about this quite a bit up here on the platform, but I think it's important for us because it's, it, sometimes we can get really sucked in to the environment we're in and the things that get whipped up in the culture and, and we forget. We forget that 
that idea of namaste, that everywhere I look, there is God present in a situation, in a person, in a in a, uh, an event that is uh, either something that I'm really happy about or something I'm unhappy about. And if we look to this idea of the profane versus the sacred, I venture to say that in the seed of that place where we might find ourselves judging things as not spiritual, not special, not sacred, not belonging. When we step into that place, it, it's, it's a place of, um, of judgment. It's a place that where we come to from maybe from some dissatisfaction that we're having with life. You know, this spiritual teaching that we talk about here on Sundays, that we teach in classes, that we share in friendship circles and other opportunities that, that we have, those... This teaching is a teaching that is reminding us of the perfection of our life. And yet our culture sometimes draws us into this place of dissatisfaction. And, and I think dissatisfaction is important at some level. If we're going to stretch or we're going to grow, dissatisfaction helps us to leave our comfort zone and to step out and to do something new or different or to more in line with who we are. But sometimes our dissatisfaction, we can get carried away about it. Any, anybody here complain? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes we can get really caught up in the downward spiraling energy of dissatisfaction and complaining and we can lose sight of the sacredness in the moment. Now, I, I have reached a stage in my life where I've had enough experiences that even when I'm on one of those downward places where I'm dissatisfied or my heart's broken or if I'm challenged by something, I know that it's really just a pathway. There's a, there's a wonderful saying that it's hell in the hallways, right? <laughs> and when we're moving through transition, oftentimes we need to deal with our dissatisfaction. We need to deal with the things we find profane in the world. We need to face them and to... to process them and to find out where they sit in us and to then remember that everything's sacred. Everything is sacred. Stephen Stills in his lyrics, if you're down and confused and if you don't remember who you're talking to, concentration slips away. And, and when I read those lyrics, I was thinking about this holiday that's coming up. Right? Thanksgiving. Now, I would, I would hope that most of us really enjoy being with our family. <laughs> the thing about family that I have come to understand is that when we're with family, even if we don't get along, the thing is, it's safe. It's so safe that we can really let the guard down and be ourselves and sometimes Aunt Louise's self and Uncle Jerry's self don't quite mesh, <laughs> right? We have those experiences with family. And I think that as we move into the holiday season, as we move into what is a very sacred time, a time for us to remember the things that we're grateful for, a time to remember the rebirth of the light within us, this, this whole holy season, it's an opportunity for us as to remember who we're talking to. We're talking to God in form. They may have different political views than I. They may have a different way of dealing with the environment than I. They may choose, they may value something different from my values, but it's still God in form and expression. And so our opportunity, let's call this a holiday opportunity, our opportunity <laughs> is to remember who we're talking to, to remember that there is God inherent in 
the people that we love as well as the people that annoy us, the people that frustrate us, the people that, that challenge us, the people that push us. I like being comfortable. I do. You know, I like it when things are running smoothly. I like it when things are moving the way I want them to. But I also appreciate it. We talked about the Board of Trustees when I started my comments. I also appreciate when somebody pushes me. I appreciate it when somebody brings forth some, an idea that I hadn't thought of. It doesn't mean that I have to embrace it. But it means I have to give it some thought. I have to see, what, where is it that spirit might be drawing me out so that I can be in greater service to the one. We talk about spirit as the one, the one mind, the one divine intelligence, the one pattern that is moving through all life. My favorite name for God, what is it? The thing that makes the grass grow, right, right, the thing that makes the grass grow. And, and and I think that when we are willing to look at, a, at, at someone who is very different than us, that we don't quite understand, somebody that we might be clashing with, somebody that has a different way of expressing themselves, when we can pause long enough to recognize that, that there might be a clue for us of some place where we might need to make an adjustment, or maybe it's a place where we, need to be, we get to confirm the values and the things that are important to us. This idea of love the one you're with became very near and dear to my heart. I had this little tiny epiphany um, a little while back. I was feeling uh, alone and missing my family, and I was sitting with it. And I heard this still small voice in my heart whisper, love the one you're with. And my mind went to, but, but I'm by myself. What do you mean, love the one you're with? And I heard exactly my point. <laughs> love the one you're with. And so this beautiful talk, um, talk title, this, this song that talks about um, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, it gives us great direction to be present with ourselves. I, 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 I venture to say as we look at the ups and downs of our culture as it's kind of moving through this change place, that somewhere in that mix is a little bit of self-loathing. Places where we don't love ourselves. Places where we, that inner critic, that voice that's in the back of our head is getting a little too loud. Places where we want to avoid that so we had to fix things. And so if we can remember this idea of love the one you're with, it allows us to temper what I'll call the false self so that we can hear the true self. One of my very favorite spiritual teachers is Richard Rohr. Father Richard Rohr, he's written on so many books. Um, and in this one book, The Immortal Diamond, The Search for Our True Self, he, he writes about the sacred and the profane, and I want to share it with you. And he writes about how, our, our, um, how to move through that to really get in touch with our true self. He starts by saying, God in you seeks and loves God like a homing device that never turns off. Don't you like that? Seeking, the thing that's in you is the thing that you're seeking is the thing that's seeking you. Holmes says that in the in the Science of Mind textbook. He goes on to say, it should be no scandal or surprise that sex is so obsessive, scary, and fascinating. It is the most dramatic way that we all try to overcome our separateness. The good, the true, the beautiful are always still beyond me, outside me, and above me. We all seem to feel incapable and unworthy of perfection, and after every moment of experienced union, we sadly fall back into the more familiar distance, yet we keep trying, and that is good. So Richard is talking about this propensity for us to 
continue to seek the greater good within ourselves, to, to look for that communion or that union with the divine. And the reason we keep, the reason you showed up here beyond your love for Diane King Van, the reason that you show up here on a Sunday morning or you take a class or you belong to a friendship circle is because that part of you that knows your God and longs to experience God in community. That's what we're about here. We're about reflecting back to each other the perfection of the human condition, even when that inner critic gets so loud and begins to say things to you like you're, you know, you're too old or you're too young or you're too thin or you're too fat or you're too poor or you're too dumb. <laughs> right? <laughs> Anybody else have an inner critic? that tries to convince you of your lack of perfection? Yeah, that's profane. <laughs> right there, that is absolutely profane. When we are so easily tempted to forget the beauty and the power and the absolute magnificence of the thing that makes the grass grow that loves life so much that it created each one of you. All life is sacred. It's sacred when I'm on the top of my game and everything's going my way. It's sacred when I make a mistake and you forgive me anyway. It's sacred when I forget the beauty and the power of each life. Ernest Holmes wrote in the 1926 version of the Science of Mind textbook, to suppose that the creative intelligence of the universe would create a person in bondage and leave them bound would be to dishonor the creative power, which we call God. So he's talking about this place where we feel so wrapped up in, and in the bondage of self that we, we get lost. To suppose that God could make a person as an individual without leaving them to discover themselves would be to suppose an impossibility. Individuality must be spontaneous. It can never be automatic. Individuality must be spontaneous. The artists in the room understand that. They understand the spontaneity of creativity as it moves through them. But I want to tell you, I don't paint, I don't draw, I don't knit or make crafts but I know my creativity. Each one of us is creative in every moment of every day. As we continue to move on this, this journey of authentic, individuated life experience, authentic, individuated life experience, I want to remind you that when it's all going your way, that's God and the sacred. And when it's not all going your way, that's God and the sacred too. <laughs> there's, no, there's no difference except that we're in transition. Much like the, that tumultuous time of the 60s or this tumultuous time in our, in our global culture, transformation, change, it's forever happening. We can fight it. We can try to control it. We can try to, try to get a sense of, give our false self a sense of safety. But the truth is that there is glory in creation. There is magnificence in creation. And whether your creation comes through music or mathematics or some form of artwork or sharing what you're thinking as a teacher all of it is sacred. Each and every one of you is a sacred expression of the divine. And I guarantee you, no matter what, there are no exceptions in this room. None whatsoever. So as you move through this, this day today where we're saying goodbye to a treasured and dear friend, or, or whether it's moving through the holidays, whether you're 
full of bliss and delight or whether you have some disappointment or some setbacks, I want you to remember that there's something sacred in all of this for you. Thank you very much. And as Diane accompanies me in this prayer, I want you to close your eyes or lower your gaze. And as you hear the soft melody behind my words, know with me that the divine, the thing that makes the grass grow and the stars shine and the earth revolve around the sun is the same thing that made each one of us. So in this moment of reflection and prayer, I invite you to put your hands on your heart and to think of one thing about you that you are grateful for. It might be your health. It might be the way you show up in the world. What is one thing that you can honor in this moment so that you can love the one you're with? And uh, I invite you as you move through this week, as we begin the holidays, to build on this gratitude. To dive deep into the pool of self-love. Knowing that you are loving God's creation exactly as God intended it. That there are no mistakes. And that even in what we deem as Imperfect is perfect as well. And so, as we anchor this piece of gratitude in our heart, we walk it out into the holidays, we walk it out into our families, we walk it out into the world, knowing that starting with self-love, it grounds us so that we can love the one we're with and recognize the divine in all we come in contact with. And so I bless this time together. I bless this prayer. I bless each one here. I know that this is God in its glory in so many diverse ways. We give thanks for this. We anchor this prayer and that power and that presence that loves all life as we say together, and so it is.